Okay, off we go. So uh, last time we were talking about green theorem. Here it is. Uh, so reminder, reminder, uh, green theorem is uh, a statement that connects um, a vector line integral to a double integral. Pretty surprising. One of the things that's always weirded me out the most about this theorem and the others that are kind of like it is that we have two integrals that are different kinds of integrals and furthermore they're computed on different domains. How could an integral that's computed on one domain and an integral computed over a different domain connected? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're different domains. How could two integrals on different domains uh, be always equal? It's very weird. Um, okay, so we saw an example last time, and the example, uh, let's see here, let me hit this button where we can see better, there we go. Uh, the example, you can see Green's theorem uh, at work right here, that that line integral is equal to this double integral. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is a uh, sticky point on this, though, and this is something you always have to be very careful about, and let's go back over here to Green's theorem. And notice very specifically, Green's theorem only allows you to compute a line integral if your domain is a boundary. And further recall the word boundary. And by the way, this little symbol, the, the, I, I know it's weird, but the partial symbol is what we use to represent boundary. To stand to the standard, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, boundaries are oriented things. Now, and you have to pay attention to the orientation, um, and that uh, orientation again. It, you might you might think, well, it's only a plus or a minus, but it's it's not. It's a plus or a minus that's representative of a really significant idea. Does that make sense to everybody? You all good? Okay, cool. All right. So um, so you got to worry about the orientations. So we look at the question that was originally asked. Our original question was uh, on a curve that was clockwise, which is not a boundary. Right? And so now the, I'm not going to go through the whole example again, but the point is clockwise is just the opposite orientation on counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is a boundary. right? So there's just a minus sign that comes out as a result of making the appropriate connections. But that minus sign, again, is representative of a very important, very significant, very subtle sophisticated idea, and as such, it really does matter, and it does count for a lot of points on tests, I'm just saying. Okay. All right. So, uh, proceeding. Here's another example. Uh, we have a curve given to us. Here it is. The curve is made up of certain line segments. There's the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. And we want to compute a, uh, a line integral of uh, this given vector field on that strange curve consisting of these four line segments. And the brute force approach to this problem is to literally parameterize each of these four line segments. It's pretty doable, right? I mean, it's a little tedious because there's four of them. But aside from that, I mean, it's basically pretty doable. Okay, that said, one thing you're going to notice pretty quickly is this curve that I'm now going to temporarily ignore orientations and just draw as a curve, it looks like a boundary, right? Certainly, it's the border between what I have in gray and what is not in gray. Right? So it's tempting to call it the boundary. Now, So it, we think, okay, our curve is a boundary. We can apply Green's theorem. Seems like that might be worth a shot, right? Thing is, we do have to be very careful with the details here, and this curve, as given, isn't really a boundary. Now, part of it is, if you look at this part of the curve, like this, that's, that's part of our curve, uh, that really is truly the boundary of uh, this uh, yellow region in here, right, D1. I mean, no kidding. It is literally orientation and all the boundary of that yellow region, right? Okay. The problem is <laughs> the other part of the curve. Uh, let's see here. This uh, what I'm going to call. I'm going to write this in red. Uh, this part of C is not a boundary, right? It just isn't. It's going the wrong way. It's going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. 
Okay. Well, so uh, again, Green's theorem is very, very delicate on this. Uh, uh, orientations really matter, and in a significant, right, meaningful way. So I cannot just declare what I have in red here to be a boundary. What I can do, though, is uh, say that what I have there in red is the opposite. Let's see here. Uh, I will point to this. Uh, with uh, uh, some exclamation points over there. It's just the opposite orientation of something that is a boundary. It's the opposite orientation on that what I'm going to call dark blue curve, right? That dark blue curve really is the boundary of this uh, D2, right? So uh, the boundary of this uh, D2 region in here. Right. So as long as I account for that fa that oppositeness, right, the sort of the the uh, orientation whoopsie, as long as I account for that with a minus sign appropriately, I can actually view this curve as being a boundary, or arguably a sum of boundaries. Uh, but the uh, punchline is uh, here we go. Um, this uh, curve that I was given is let's see, let me get my colors right. Uh, we're going to look at as in light blue this boundary uh, of, uh, of D1, right? And then, uh, let's see here, the rest of the curve is what I have in red. Let's see here, uh, in red, right? But we've made the observation that that red is just the opposite of what I have in dark blue, which again is a boundary. And again, being the opposite, right? Because it's the opposite, we got to put a minus sign right there. Everybody on board? So great. So we've got our um, we've got our thing set up. Uh, all of the subtle, sophisticated ideas concerning orientations are properly accounted for. All I had to do was throw in this minus sign, right? And uh, now I've got a couple of double integrals. And uh, okay, um, you know. So again, applying Green's theorem. Here's Green's theorem applied to D1. Here's Green's theorem applied to D2. A couple of double integrals result. Okay, fine. I'm going to have to compute Green's operator, right? But uh, keep in mind our vector field is uh, pretty straightforward. It's right there. It's uh, the various partials are pretty easy to deal with, right? Uh, and so uh, Green's operator, pretty easy computation. Turns out to be nine, whatever. And now we have some easy integrals. These are each of these integrals is an integral over a triangle. Each of them has an integrand, which is a constant. Gotta love it, right? The constants factor out. Now we have integrals of one, which just gives you area, blah blah details, and y'all can uh, check those details. And this works out to be zero. So um, all together, this is a much easier, much more direct, well, just better way to compute this original line integral. Is everybody with me? Okay, so heads up on orientations, and uh, uh, and other other than that, uh, enjoy uh, using Green's theorem. Very powerful. Okay, here is a uh, another example. This is an example that actually leads to a a, 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 a nice little quick little result. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Green's theorem again. Here it is, Green's theorem, line integral around the boundary, double integral of Green's operator. Now you'll notice I'm applying Green's theorem here to a very specific vector field, and this is a special vector field. It's not unique. Uh, there's there's other vector. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Really quickly for that last problem, could you use a symmetry argument? Uh, could you use a symmetry argument with the original vector line integral? Absolutely not. Like, like converting it to a symmetry. You could. Uh, well, I'm off the top of my head. I'm not clear that that would work. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the original vector field, yeah, I'm kind of betting against on this having, I don't know, I haven't worked it out, but I, uh, there are some weird numbers. I mean, the, the line of symmetry here, or arguably here, depending on which one you pick, that doesn't go through the origin, so there's going to be some weird numbers involved. I wouldn't be betting that it would work. You're welcome to try it, but I'd, I'd be betting against. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Green's theorem here, now applied to a special, not unique, but special vector field, 0, x. 
And what's cool about this vector field is it makes Green's operator really easy to compute, and specifically Green's operator of that vector field happens to be 1. Wait a minute. That means I, on the double integral side of the theorem, I'm looking at literally a double integral of 1. That literally gives me the area of the region. So what we have here then is we have a line integral that allows us to compute the area of what's inside of it. Kind of wild. Now uh, the uh, <clears throat> to the left here there is uh, one additional observation and this is not such a big deal but uh, remember we have this coordinate uh, notational alternative and uh, recalling that dx vector is dx dy and you write down the dot product is in coordinate notation this would be integral x dy and again you know most of the time I'm not really in favor of using that notation uh, but uh, in this case I think a fair you know comparison I think this is a little bit more compact in this case rare but true sometimes you know sometimes it happens to be kind of nice so you're going to see, in fact, this theorem that I'm in the process of showing you, this, you're going to see it written as integral x dy equals area, as opposed to this uh, slightly bulkier, clunkier notation here. So, anyway. Okay, so uh, who cares? There is a point of view that says, uh, you know what, I was computing areas all the way through high school geometry, never needed a vector line integral or a coordinate line integral or whatever that thing is. Uh, and uh, why should we, you know, bring big guns to trivial problems? The answer is sometimes it's really handy. Uh, so uh, specifically, this integral, integral x dy. If you're interested in computing it on a straight line segment, the formula works out really nicely. It's just pretty great. Now, uh, this not for the whole boundary, right? A boundary can't be a single line segment, right? This statement here where I say you can compute this with this easy formula just for straight line segments. Um, nevertheless, sometimes your boundary is made up of little line segments. And so here's, the, uh, here's how we're going to make use of this uh, result. Again, our big uh, result from above is that uh, area is integral x dy around the boundary. That boundary might be made up of a bunch of individual line segments, as you'd see here. Right here I have various line segments that make up what is, in fact, the boundary of this horrifying geometric shape. Yep. Okay. All right. So individually on any given single part of the boundary then that is literally integral over a line segment and so that one line segment at a time you can compute with this super handy formula right there and then you just have to add up over all those segments well you get a really uh, uh, clever trick yeah would you go over again? How did we get the, that formula for like a straight? Oh yeah, no. This is an exercise for y'all to work out. Uh, this is a, a lot of plug and chug, but you can directly check this formula right here. Yeah. So just uh, parameterize that line segment, which you know how to do, right? Mm -hmm. We have formulas for what this means. Crank, and you're going to get this as your result. Yeah. Yeah. Good exercise, by the way. I hope everyone will will uh, go through that. It's a yeah. You don't have to, but I think it's a it's a it's a good en a mental exercise. Um, okay, so here we go. Let's. I'm not going to go through all of the arithmetic here, but I'm going to do uh, sort of uh, yeah. Oh, whoopsie. I'm going to do uh, one of the line segments here. We'll look at this first line segment now, just so that I can have my um, uh, my arithmetic uh, easier. I'm going to emphasize what these coordinates are for these points. Like so. Okay, now let's ask, per our formula, what is, um, let me come up to here, what is our average value of x for this one particular line segment, looking just at the first line segment? Well, it's going to be the average of the starting value and the ending value, and that average is uh, about six and a half. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see here. What is delta y? How much does y change? Uh, notice that this is a directional thing. This does not say just uh, what is the difference. Um, uh, you know, uh, how much uh, you know vertical distance are we talking about? It's specifically y2 minus y1, the ending y value minus the starting y value. Right? And in this case, looking at the direction that this edge is going, you can see it's going from this point to that point, and so delta y is 6 minus 1, which is 5. Everybody happy? Following the formula, uh, on this edge, green times blue. Uh, tells me what the line integral is on that edge. And so we have now successfully computed uh, trivial arithmetic, uh, what, the, uh, what the contribution is from that edge. And now we just have to go around the remaining edges. I say we. Uh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I already did it. Right? Y'all can follow. Y'all can uh, check a few if you like. Obviously, there's no need to go through all of this arithmetic. But uh, nevertheless, still just pretty straightforward arithmetic and you get an answer for this area. And to the question of uh, was it worth it, um, I will point out that um, otherwise, without this trick, computing this area is pretty hard. Right? This is a pretty weird looking shape here. Uh, there's a lot of not right angles in this picture. Right? How, I mean, seriously, uh, how would you break this up into pieces? And I, I suppose you know one thing you could do uh, and that there, there, there are more clever ways to do this as well, but you could kind of, you know, break it up into triangles, kind of like this. Uh, let's see, would that do it? Yeah, that's, uh, what's that, seven separate triangles. Again, mostly not right triangles. How do you compute the area if it's not a right triangle? Well, you could, oh my gosh, right? You could drop projections and compute the height and base, but of course the base is going to involve square roots. Computing those projections right, is, is an effort as well, and uh, there's actually a lot of ugly that would go into that. Or you could use Heron's formula. After all, they are triangles. I don't know if you all remember or saw Heron's formula back in high school geometry, but it allows you to compute the area of any triangle. But it involves square roots of plenty. And so again, a kind of a nightmare approach. So what we have here, inconvenient though it is, I think is still much less inconvenient than the other apparent alternatives. Okay, so neat trick. All right, moving along. Um, flux through a curve. This is a, uh, a new-ish approach to an idea that we've seen before. We've talked about flux of a fluid through a surface. Right, well, at least through a flat surface. Uh, and we made an argument that uh, flux is useful because it allows you to compute well, what we call the flow rate. Right? Oh, uh, let's see, let me get back into this mode. The uh, flow rate of the fluid through your surface in the case that we've seen before. And I'm going to make the observation that if you have not a three-dimensional fluid but a two-dimensional fluid, two-dimensional scenario, and if you look at a piece of curve, like a little line segment, when you have a flow of the fluid, okay, and there's fluid flowing along uh, like this, you can talk about how much fluid per unit time is passing through that curve in this case because it's two-dimensional instead of surface as we saw previously when it was three-dimensional. Make sense? Uh, believable? Um, if you're looking for a nice little uh, challenge, not even a little, if you're looking for a, uh, a challenge, right? um, a great exercise, totally doable, it's going to make you think, right? but uh, how would you justify this formula? And what you would do is you'd go back to the calculation from chapter three where we talked about the three-dimensional fluid and the area and the, the, you know, as it goes through, it makes a little parallelopiped, you compute the volume, blah, blah. The analogous thing here would be to imagine the parallelogram that would get created and uh, go through and think through details of, uh, you know, uh, what does the vector field represent and uh, what uh, correspondingly 
is the flow rate, what, what interpretation would you make of the flow rate? And again, you're going to come up with two very reasonable uh, results. Okay. All right. So that noted this formula for flux on a line segment. Um, we can ask, what if I have a more complicated situation? Oh, and you know what I forgot to do? I'm sorry. I had intended to come through here and scratch off that. For the moment, we'll come back to this in a few minutes. For the moment, let's not look at that. Um, if I have a uh, uh, two-dimensional region such as uh, this here, there's my two-dimensional region D. And if I want to talk about its boundary, keep in mind we know what a boundary is. Boundary is a curve. Oh, gosh. It's a curve that kind of kind of like that. Um, we could talk about, well, what's the flux through that boundary? Right? So maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a, a surface water that's flowing on the surface, and uh, this is, uh, you know, my farmland over here, and then this is the boundary, and then this is somebody else's farmland over there. If the water is flowing out of my land and onto their land, I have loosened water. Water is valuable, <laughs> um, certainly if you have a big farm. Um, so uh, something like, you know, keeping track of boundary flux is a great way to keep track of how fast are you losing your stuff on the region that you're interested in. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's talk about, oh, uh, there, there is a, a detail here, another convention, another arbitrary but standard convention. When you're talking about a boundary, and again, anytime you see the word boundary, you should your first reaction should be, oop, ah, orientation, which way is the orientation? Right, so if we're talking about flux, if we're talking about going through the boundary, along the boundary in one direction or another doesn't really help us, right? So I have to have a convention for when I say boundary and when I'm talking about going through that curve, not along, what's the convention for what we mean by boundary? What is the orientation that we assume? And the answer is uh, outward, away from your region, as opposed to inward or into your region. Okay, is that cool? Arbitrary, but standard. Okay. All right. So how are we going to do this? Well, no problem. Uh, what I would do is take my curve and chop it up into little pieces. And on any little piece of curve, let's say from there to there, on that little piece of curve, I would be able to compute how much flux there is on that little bitty piece of curve. And then I would add up over the entire curve. All right. So I'm going to then uh, add up with an integral like so over that entire curve. How would I compute the flux on the little piece? Well, on this little piece, again, this is approximately straight. The vector field is approximately constant. We can use the formula from the previous page. And on that previous page, oh, whoopsie. On that previous page, we have this. And notice the length. Right. One, of the, one of the components of computing flux is I need to know the length of the line segment we're talking about. Well, that length is ds. It represents literally the length of a little piece of curve. And again, we've got standard uh, uh, developed you know, conventions and notations and geometry for you know, little pieces of curve. So we're just going to steal all that. Okay. So grand total. Uh, the grand total boundary flux would be this formula right here. And uh, frankly, that's not familiar. We've never seen uh, this formula. We've never seen an integral that looks like this. An integral on a curve, ds, which makes it look like a scalar line integral, except on the inside there's an orientation of sorts. There's this outward pointing unit normal vector. So it's it's kind of like a vector line integral in the sense that there's an orientation, but it's not t. And it's kind of like a scalar line integral in the sense that there's this ds out here, but it's not uh, purely a uh, function of location on the inside. So again, kind of different. Um, so we got to figure out what to do with that, and uh, here's the way we resolve that, and this is where we're going to come back up here. Um, 
<clears throat> to this setup. Uh, wonderfully convenient little observation. If you are looking at a normal vector and a vector field, as of course we are in this situation, right? notice that we can compare it to the tangent vector. Now there's my counterclockwise, right? Regions on my left, however you want to say it. There's my standard orientation tangent vector. And I can compare that as well with what I'm going to call f perp, uh, where these are what I get by uh, doing, uh, whoopsie, uh, bad color choice. Uh, hang on, hang on. We'll use orange. Uh, 90 degree rotations, right? So uh, the tangent vector is a 90 degree rotation counterclockwise of my normal vector, and my f perp, I'm calling it, is a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation uh, from my f. And beautiful observation, dot products, right, I'm interested in this green dot product, dot products only depend on magnitude and angle. And if I rotate both of them the same amount, the magnitudes don't change, the angle between them doesn't change. Right? And so, uh, let's see here, I'll do this in, oh, I'll do this in, let me use the highlighter, I'll do this in yellow. Uh, this dot product, F dot N, that dot product there by the geometry is equal to that product there. So F dot N is F perp dot T. And that means I can, in this formula here, literally replace f dot n with f perp dot t. And uh, the big win on this is now let's look at the, what the integral has turned into. Now it's an integral on a curve of uh, a vector field dot t ds. That's literally a vector line integral as previously discussed. t ds is dx. Straight up, boring, no asterisk, vector line integral that we know how to compute. Right, it's a real clever move, real slick. Wish I thought of it. Okay. All right. So with all of this noted, how are we going to compute a uh, vector line integral? Oh, ah, better. This is not just a vector line integral. This is a vector line integral around a boundary. Boundary vector line integrals. Boundary circulations. All right. We have a big theorem for boundary circulations. Boundary circulations can be computed with Green's theorem. Just writing it down. Okay. All right, now, so uh, how do we compute uh, Green's operator here? Now, you want to be really careful. Uh, it's tempting to mis, um, misinterpret. I know you all have a tendency, everyone has a tendency to remember formulas symbolically. Right? And we, we remember Green's operator is dq dx minus dp dy. It's not really quite what the formula says. That's Green's operator applied to the vector field p comma q. So uh, if you're not applying it to p comma q, and very importantly here I'm not, I hear I'm applying this to f perp. It's not p comma q. Right? Let's think of this instead. Let's think of Green's operator as being... Uh, let's see here. Green's operator is the x partial of the second component of the vector field minus the y partial of the first component of the vector field. And notice in this case, the second component that we typically call q is actually p. Right? And the first component that we typically call P, in this case, is actually minus Q. So Green's operator applied to F perp, which again, is what we're dealing with, is this formula right there. Is everybody, how we doing? Is everybody on board? Okay, okay. so um, now it's just a couple of details. Uh, these minus signs here cancel comfortably, no big deal. Uh, our formula then uh, ends up being this. Uh, deal here, whatever that is, uh, 
partial of P with respect to X plus partial of Q with respect to Y. And I wonder if maybe this might ring some bells. I know chapter three was a long time ago, but this is actually a thing that we've seen before. We haven't really studied it much, but it is something we have seen before. This is what we call divergence, uh, which we denote with that expression right there. And this is two-dimensional divergence. So, all right, now this was a, there was a lot of little details in this calculation, but the nice punchline is if you are interested in computing a two-dimensional boundary flux, and let me uh, just be more explicit, a two-dimensional boundary flux around you know, the boundary curve of a two-dimensional region, we have ourselves a formula for how to do that with a double integral. And so again, another weird result where, uh, wait a minute, uh, this integral is computed on the boundary, this integral is computed in the interior. Those are two different domains. How could this be related to each other? Um, furthermore, hey, wait a minute, this is a, this is a line integral. This is a double integral. Again, it, they seem really different. So it's a jaw dropper that these are actually always equal to each other. Everybody all right? All right. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, this is called the two-dimensional divergence theorem. There's a three-dimensional version of this that we're going to see later on. Um, and I'm going to give you a different perspective on this theorem in just a few minutes, time permitting. We'll see. Uh, but uh, first, a quick example. And uh, here we go. Uh, we want to compute uh, the flux of this vector field uh, along this oriented curve. See, notice the orientation. It says right there, outward. Again, always heads up with orientations. Really important. It really matters. Right, and again, it's just a, I know it's just a plus or a minus, but that's a plus or a minus connected to deep, sophisticated, important ideas, and so it matters a lot, especially point-wise on exams. Again, I'm just saying. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, how are we going to compute this flux? Now, again, you could brute force it. Right? The, the, the brute force approach would be to say, all right, well, I guess I'm going to have to write down a formula for my unit normal vector. Yeah, and uh, I can write formulas for ds, and then I can scalar line integral. And, oh, okay, I guess we could pull back through the parameterization, and we could do that, All right? But it's going to be tedious. It's going to be ugly. You're not going to like it. Um, so what we are, of course, going to do instead uh, is uh, is cite the formula above. And the formula above says if your curve is a boundary. And this is. This is outward oriented. Circle is the boundary of the disk on the inside. Orientation correct and everything. So when you have a boundary, uh, that boundary flux that you're interested in, uh, whoops, according to our two-dimensional divergence theorem, that flux is a double integral of divergence over that interior. That's the big gun. That's where that's where the that's where the the, this is the meat of the argument here. This is where the, 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 the good stuff happens, right? And everything else is kind of details. Uh, yes, we do have a vector field here, and yes, I am going to have to compute the divergence of that vector field. Um, eh, okay, I mean, it, it's a couple of partial derivatives. Notice it turns out to actually be really nice, right? The divergence is negative 3. And that turns this, of course, into a super easy integral that you all can compute yourselves, uh, no big. And uh, there you go, minus 3 pi. I didn't have to deal with this exponential. I was pretty scared of this cosecant. Didn't come up. Everybody happy? All right. All righty. Okay, so different point of view on this. Um, you know, I uh, previously, I'll do it like this, uh, I previously presented this outward-oriented boundary flux as something that I can kind of, you know, I can kind of turn my head to the side and kind of reinterpret uh, from a rotated point of view, uh, and uh, through through this kind of trickery, I could rewrite as a as a double integral 
of divergence. But here's an alternative point of view I think is actually really good. Um, and that is outward oriented boundary flux by itself. Forget about circulation. Outward oriented boundary flux is an accumulating quantity. Whenever you have any accumulating quantity, you can kind of go through the basic structure of the argument that we made to, to do Green's theorem. It's an accumulating quantity. You, the whole is the sum of the parts. You can talk about the associated density and theorem. So uh, the fact that this is an accumulating quantity is awesome. And uh, why is it an accumulating quantity? Well, here's the uh, outward-oriented boundary flux for D1. Right, the left half of our sort of lump here. And then let's see, here is the outward-oriented boundary flux for D2, the right half of our lump. And I ask what happens when I add these up, and I'm just going to, you know, um, write it down here. Uh, the D1 boundary flux plus the D2 boundary flux. We're going to have green plus blue. Notice that we get a wonderful cancellation uh, on this shared edge here, on this shared edge. Uh, yeah, that shared edge appears twice. We're going to look at flux to the right as part of the boundary of D1. We're going to look at flux to the left as part of the boundary of D2. And so uh, these two terms on that shared edge the, sort of the cut edge, you know, where we cut the hole into two parts. Uh, opposite orientations, and they cancel. And so, poof, all that goes away. Uh, notice that what's left, the remaining green that didn't cancel, the remaining blue that didn't cancel, uh, that is the boundary flux on the hole. So the whole sum of the parts, and again, very counterintuitive, very weird. It uh, doesn't seem like it ought to work, but it does. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, just a quick summary of uh, our various uh, accumulation arguments that we've seen so far. Um, the, uh, the first, this is actually a collection of a bunch of arguments uh, right here. I like to talk about mass because it's so relatable, it's so physical, and just, I just, it's, it, there's nothing subtle about it, right? And we look at it all day long, right? And uh, mass, the whole is the sum of the parts. Mass is density times area. Well, of course it is. That's the definition of density, right? And so uh, we have uh, the ability to compute this accumulating quantity as a double integral, uh, as we've done many times. So I'm going to make the observation here that all of these accumulating quantities go through basically the same, same basic idea, right? Mass is an accumulating quantity. Uh, circulation is an accumulating quantity, as we noted last time. Boundary flux, as we just saw, is an accumulating quantity. For those, the whole is the sum of the parts. For each one of those, there is a corresponding sort of uh, what do you get? Uh, let him, well, let's see, how am I going to do this? Uh, let me circle these. There is an associated uh, what do you get when you kind of factor out a DA, as it were, right? And each one of these is correspondingly a density because it's quantity per unit area. What kind of density? Well, it's a density associated to, well, what are you computing? Here, in this top line, we call this mass density because it is mass per unit area. Right? Likewise, over here, this is circulation density because we're looking at circulation per unit area. And of course, just to, you know, um, sort of finish uh, the, uh, the comparison, uh, what should I, how should I think of divergence? What, what does divergence 
uh, how should I, what's the intuition for it? What does it look like? How do you think about it? Well, it's flux per unit area and thus flux density. Everybody buy it? Now, uh, let's talk about how these terms are used in the real world. Um, uh, obviously, you all, all saw whoops, uh, this idea of mass density. You saw that probably in middle school, I'm guessing. I don't know, certainly high school. Um, a pretty standard idea in, uh, oh, gosh, they don't even call it physics. Uh, that it, at least not in my high school. I think I took this in middle school, maybe, or I forget. It was called physical science, whatever, right? Same class where we were learning about geology and everything. Okay. So old concept. Um, this one here, circulation density, understanding Green's operator as circulation density, uh, is uh, out there. I did not dream this up. You're going to see here and there. Uh, this interpretation. Uh, and again, I think it's super valuable. If you want to have intuition for why Green's theorem works, uh, as opposed to it just being a magic wand that just turns line integrals into double integrals, right? this is the intuition. It's the fact that this integrand is a density of an accumulating quantity. That's what makes it all hold together. Right? Nevertheless, this term is not... Uh, it's not out there as much as I wish it were. Um, by comparison, though, uh, this one really is. Flux density, extremely common. In fact, in my undergraduate physics major, I heard the term flux density in my physics classes more than I heard the term divergence. Because it's so communicative of what that's really doing and what it means and how you should think about it, right? So I love the fact that this is such a popular term uh, in, uh, in, well, at least in physics classes, well, at least uh, however many years ago that was. Let's not worry about that detail. Uh, uh, but I assume it still is, and I assume it would be very similar in engineering classes. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So... Again, these are, these are uh, widespread ideas. Okay, so uh, now real quick, uh, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, I know you all know the fundamental theorem. I'm not, my goal here is not to teach you the fundamental theorem. I uh, sort of assume that you already are, are solid right, on that. Um, by the way, if you're not, uh, uh, you want to definitely take care of that. And make sure that you're really good with what the fundamental theorem of calculus is specifically. A lot of people get confused about what the th fundamental theorem is even, right? The fundamental theorem is that thing that you do that turns an integral into some expression f of b minus f of a. That's where the fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. All right. <clears throat> so there are various different points of view you can take on that, and they're all fine, no problem. I want to take a certain point of view. Uh, you might even be able to see this coming, but this thing, you might want to say f of b minus f of a, again, familiar, right? That's the, that's the formula, right? What it is, is an accumulating quantity. If you think about it, right? If you have uh, an interval from here to here, and you look at f of b minus f of a computed on the whole region, right? Now suppose you cut that in, in the middle somewhere, and uh, you have uh, you could talk about f of c minus f of a on this side, and f of b minus f of c on this side. The you know so the quantity for the whole interval, the quantity for one piece of the interval, the quantity for the other piece of the they add up just like they're supposed to. It's literally a quantity that accumulates over intervals. So, um, once you know that you have an accumulating quantity, the whole is the sum of the parts. Notice this notation I'm using to represent uh, <coughs> change, is what I'm calling it. F of B minus F of A is a lot of syllables. It's a lot easier to just say change. Um, and uh, change accumulates. The whole is the sum of the parts. And then furthermore, we can talk about, um, <clears throat> for a little piece of change, let's see if I'm going to come down here, uh, let's see, I can see more of the picture, uh, how would I compute change? Output change is derivative times input change, right? 
And you can see all of this on the picture. Uh, if I have some little, let's say, a point there for a particular value of x, and if I look at the associated little triangle, uh, my change, my d delta, I think of as being the rise, right? And then uh, this little dx here, you think of that as being the run. And we know that the derivative is the slope, which is the rise over the run. Again, old news, right? I, I presume you all will remember all this. And so we have this interpretation of a derivative as being the rise over the run. And I'm going to push for a different point of view. It's kind of fly. Uh, different point of view on the derivative. Well, yes, of course it is a slope. And yes, of course it can be interpreted various other ways. It can be interpreted as a velocity in a you know certain setup. Here, I'm going to add to your points of view on the derivative. I want to interpret the derivative as a density. It really is very literally a density because we have an accumulating quantity called change. Right? Now, you can think of this as a rise on the graph, but it is also a piece of change. Change is an accumulating quantity. And the derivative is how much of that there is per unit dx, which, again, you can think of as the run, but let's not. dx is the size of this little x interval over which that change happens. So rise over the run, old news, fine. Not, not that it's wrong, but we want to take this new point of view. This is change per unit size. Quantity, accumulating quantity per unit size is literally a density. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, accumulation point of view on the fundamental theorem goes like that. Now, uh, what's the point of this? Well, whenever analogies happen, I think they're worth observing. It's worth noticing when... Things are oddly, weirdly similar to each other. Right? So Green's theorem and our two-dimensional divergence theorem that we were just talking about, they've got a lot of the same earmarks as the fundamental theorem of calculus. Weird. Right? Um, the other uh, purpose is that uh, we have existing satisfaction about how to think about derivatives. Uh, derivative is, uh, well, again, a bunch of different points of view. But it tells you how much of the change that you're observing is happening where, right? So the fact that the derivative is large there tells you that, yeah, the function is doing a significant amount of changing there. And the fact that the derivative is zero over here tells you that, uh, yeah, not really, the function's not really doing a lot of changing over here. There's no change happening here, right? So <clears throat> a pretty uncontroversial statement. I think, and uh, here it is, uh, while total change is measured by looking at the endpoints, right? I mean, f of b minus f of a, that's how you compute total change. It's computed at the endpoint. It's computed on the boundary of our interval, you might say. Sure, that's where it's computed. That's not where it happens, right? Uh, if we say, if we make the observation that, okay, I computed f of b minus f of a, my function changed by that amount, would it be fair for me to say the function changed at these two points? No, nonsense. Perfectly obvious. Could not be more clear. The function's changing in here. See? Right? <laughs> it's right there in the picture. You can see the function getting bigger. Right? And the indicator that that's what's happening is because the derivative is large there, right? So said differently, our change density is telling us where in the interior the change is actually happening. Now, just a, a, a silly example. Uh, let's see here. Um, this function here changes by... 9 on this interval from 0 to 3. Now, again, that's that's uh, middle school plugging in uh, arithmetic, right? Over this interval from 0 to 3, the grand total change of this function is 9. Now, uh, is there more change happening at the point 1 
or is there more change happening at the point two? Where, where is there more change? I mean, obviously the change happens on the whole interval, but where is there, is there more change at one of these points or the other? Well, you look at the derivative. The derivative just straight up tells you which one has the greater derivative. That's where there's more change happening. And of course, there's more change happening at two, and you can see it right there in the picture. Okay. So the reason I like this uh, observation is if I go back really quickly, uh, let's see here. I go back really quickly to um, the, uh, here it is, yeah. This observation here, this always goes down weird. This is always kind of a tough swallow for students that, uh, you know, um, circulation that actually is computed on the boundary, but I claimed it's actually distributed across the interior, which seems ridiculous. Well, it's computed on the boundary. How could something that's computed on the boundary in any sense actually be happening on the interior? And the answer is, well, that's exactly what we're seeing here with the uh, fundamental theorem. The change that actually the, that we compute on the boundary, literally, no imagination required, straight up is happening in the interior. It's just easier to visualize here because it's a simpler context. But it's in exactly this same way that, uh, again, uh, oh gosh, so far back, that uh, this circulation that happens on the boundary is, again, very literally actually happening in the interior. And you should think of it that way because that's, that's where all the good intuition is. And I'm out of time. See you all later. Have a good one. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, attendance, of course, uh, once I get this wrapped up.